In ancient times, Adam and Eve were banished from their Edenic home, a consequence of their disobedience. Their trespass allowed malevolent forces easier access, making Eden no longer safe. Their innocence was lost, and in its place, guilt took root. Yet, all is not lost. Through Christ's sacrifice at Calvary, a restoration process began, promising to return everything to its original Edenic state. Every divine institution is destined for restoration. Even the tree of life once forbidden is to be made accessible again through Christ. As prophesied in Ezekiel, a plant of renown will be raised to quell the hunger of the people. The path to the tree of life is being illuminated for all to partake. Wisdom is the key to this journey, a source of longevity, wealth, honor, peace, and pleasantness. Indeed, wisdom is the tree of life to those who embrace her, bringing happiness to those who retain her. Remember, the Proverbs say, Happy is the man who finds wisdom, she is a tree of life to those who take hold of her. Remember this, for it is the journey we all must undertake, a path to wisdom, a path to life. He placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubim, and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the Tree of Life. Genesis 3.24 From a cursory reading of Genesis 3.23-24, it might appear that God was trying to prevent us from ever reaching the Tree of Life by stationing cherubim and a flaming sword between us and the tree to keep its way, a sort of impenetrable barrier as it were. Holy angels were sent to debar their way to the tree of life. Around these angels flashed beams of light on every side which had the appearance of glittering swords. The Hebrew word translated keep in this verse is the same word where it reads, And the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to dress it and keep it. Genesis 2.15 And ye shall keep the Sabbath. Exodus 31.14 so if the flaming sword is keeping the way to the tree of life, then the thought is, the bad is kept out, but the good is allowed in. To keep the garden is to keep out evil, Satan, and allow in good, heaven's angels. To keep the Sabbath is to keep the good, the commandments of God, enter into his rest. And to reject the bad, the commandments of men, do your own ways, find your own pleasure, and speak your own words. For the angels to keep the way of the tree of life then, is for them to give access to her to those born of the Spirit, but not those who are born only after the flesh. John 3, 6. Though it is true that, not one of Adam's family has passed that flaming sword and partaken of that tree, therefore there is not an immortal sinner. It is also true that through Christ, wisdom is tree of life to those who take hold of her. Proverbs 3:18. When speaking of the workings of the Holy Spirit in his life and that of John the Baptist, Jesus said, Wisdom is justified of all her children. Luke 7.35 It was natural for Jesus to speak of wisdom in the feminine gender, because the Hebrew word, hukmah, wisdom, is feminine. The same is true of the Hebrew word for spirit, ruah. At the time he made that revelation concerning the motherly aspect of wisdom, Jesus had been revealing much about God's fatherhood in order to clarify the misconceptions held by his people. One of the purposes of this was to establish the foundation whereby he could declare his sonship. The things which he was teaching regarding him being God's only begotten son seemed so strange to his hearers that they at times would seek to take his life for having spoken what they believed to be blasphemy. John 10 30, 39. Christ understood that those to whom he was sent, his people, were so full of misconceptions about God that they could be described as follows. They also have erred through wine, and through strong drink are out of the way. The priest and the prophet have erred through strong drink, they are swallowed up of wine, they are out of the way through strong drink, they err in vision, they stumble in judgment, for all tables are full of vomit and filthiness, so that there is no place clean. Isaiah 28, 7, 8. He also knew that only a few would be able to grasp the reality of what they were hearing. He understood as did Isaiah the question, Whom shall he teach knowledge, and whom shall he make to understand doctrine? And its answer, Them that are weaned from the milk, and drawn from the breasts. Verse 9. 
Have you ever wondered why Christ often used the metaphor of milk to explain the teachings of faith? It's a thought that might have crossed your mind during a sermon or a Bible study. Today, we're going to dive deep into that metaphor and unravel its significance. In the book of Hebrews, it's written that believers are expected to mature and comprehend the deeper truths of faith. The text uses the metaphor of milk and meat to explain this. Milk in this context symbolizes the basic teachings of faith suitable for those new to the faith or the babes. On the other hand, meat represents the deeper, more complex teachings meant for those who are of full age or have matured in their faith. Peter, one of Jesus' apostles, also echoed this sentiment in his writings. 1 Peter 2, 2 Peter understood that the sincere milk of the word came through the spirit of truth. He also naturally understood that a baby's milk comes forth from mothers. He urged the newborn babes of faith to desire the sincere milk of the word, which he believed came through the spirit of truth. Isn't this interesting? The milk metaphor is not just about the teachings of faith, but also about the source from which it comes, the Holy Spirit. Now, let's consider the book of John, where Jesus speaks about sending the Holy Spirit as a comforter. He assures that his followers will not be left comfortless or as orphans. This suggests that the Holy Spirit has a motherly aspect, providing comfort and guidance, similar to a mother's nurturing role. Furthermore, in a conversation with Nicodemus, Jesus compared being born of the Spirit to being born of a woman. This further underscores the feminine nature of the Spirit and, by extension, the motherly role the Holy Spirit plays. But why is this important? Because, as Jesus said, there are many things that he wanted to say to his followers, but they were not ready to bear them. The same sentiment is echoed in the letter to the Hebrews. There are teachings that are yet to be revealed by the Father through the Holy Spirit. And this is where the metaphor of milk becomes crucial. Just as a baby needs milk to grow and mature, believers need the milk of the teachings of faith to grow in their spiritual journey. The Holy Spirit, like a mother, provides this nourishment. So, to sum up, the metaphor of milk in the teachings of Christ is a symbol of the basic teachings of faith. It also signifies the nurturing role of the Holy Spirit, akin to a mother providing milk to her newborn. As believers mature in their faith, they are expected to move on to the meat of the teachings, delving deeper into the truths of faith. And remember, as Proverbs states, wisdom cries out in the streets and she utters her voice in the city. This wisdom is the Holy Spirit calling out to us, ready to share the teachings of faith, if only we are ready to listen and learn. So let's keep our ears and hearts open to this wisdom, to this milk and grow in our faith. Have you ever wondered why the Holy Spirit is often associated with wisdom? We're diving deep into the biblical connections between the Holy Spirit and wisdom and we'll unravel some profound truths. We start with the words of Jesus Christ in John 16 verse 8 where he says, The Holy Spirit will reprove the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Jesus also mentions in verse 13 that the Holy Spirit will lead you into all truth. These statements echo the promises of wisdom in Proverbs 1 verse 28 where she says, I will pour out my spirit unto you, I will make my words known unto you. Delving deeper we find in John 14 verse 7, Jesus declares about the Holy Spirit, whom the world cannot receive because it seeth her not neither knoweth her, but ye know her, for she dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. In this instance, we've used feminine pronouns, reflecting the language Jesus originally spoke, Paleo-Hebrew or Old Aramaic, rather than the English translation from the Greek. In this place, the English translation is not even accurate to the Greek, for the Greek word for spirit is neuterit. This use of the feminine pronoun aligns with what wisdom says about herself in Proverbs 1 verses 24 to 25. She states, I have called and ye refused. I have stretched out my hand and no man regarded, but ye have set at naught all my counsel and would none of my reproof. 
Yet wisdom promises those who heed her that she shall give to thine head an ornament of grace, a crown of glory shall she deliver to thee. Proverbs 4 verse 9 Further, she invites us in Proverbs 8 verse 20 and 9 verse 5 saying, I lead in the way of righteousness, in the midst of the paths of judgment. Come, eat of my bread, and drink of the wine which I have mingled. In conclusion, the Holy Spirit and wisdom are deeply entwined. Both are described as unseen and unknown to the world, yet they promise guidance, truth, and righteousness to those who receive them. The Holy Spirit, as described by Jesus, reproves the world of sin, leads into all truth, and dwells within believers. Similarly, wisdom calls out to the world, offering her counsel and reproof, and promises a crown of glory to those who regard her. Therefore, to know and see wisdom is to recognize the presence of the Holy Spirit and to find the tree of life. So let wisdom guide you on your spiritual journey, and may you feel the Holy Spirit's presence in every step you take.